I was asked to give a kind of review on, on, on neutrinos double beta decay matrix elements, but you see, to be honest, just to talk about that is a bit dull. So, I mean, then I, I, I expanded the sphere of my talk uh, to show some, some, some interesting new things which are related to even the neutrinos double beta decay. So, I mean, we have different type of weak processes, rare weak processes. These are all rare weak processes. And how are these coming about? Uh, these are coming from very low Q values. Then we have also uh, higher order processes for, for uh, weak decays. So, for example, double beta decays. Then we have also uh, all this kind of forbidden beta decays where you have large changes in the initial and final uh, angular momentum. So uh, this is a recent review on all these aspects which I'm talk talking about, also going beyond actually the neutrino nucleus scattering, uh, charge exchange reactions, and so on. So I urge you to take a look at this, this uh, review. It has uh, something like 750 references. So I mean, it is one of the world records, I think, in that, that sense. So um, we have this problem, which Kai mentioned already, uh, this problem of the axial vector coupling and this effective value. And we have several, uh, this, this comes uh, about everywhere. So, I mean, we have uh, it appearing in studies of rare beta decays, but also in, in neutrino physics, double beta decays, muon capture, uh, neutrino nucleus, low energy neutrino nucleus scattering is, is one of these instances. Then in processes in astrophysics, again, beta decays, neutrino nucleus interactions, and so on. So it is very ubiquitous. Everywhere you ha ha somehow collide with this, this kind of problem. So, um, so how is this, this uh, uh, effective value coming about? So for at the quark level, everything is fine, very well defined. So you have this, this value of unity. Then uh, this is already a harsh step here. If you think about, for example, free neutron and its decay, you can determine from that half-life uh, the free value 1.27 of this, this uh, axial coupling. Then if you go to uh, nuclei, you have effective uh, nucleon current there, and there you again uh, somehow uh, have this problem, especially here you have the problem of this effective value of the axial coupling. I mean, for uh, vector coupling you have this concert vector current hypothesis which protects its value in principle, but, but this axial coupling is not protected by that strict law. Uh, and, and now to answer uh, Horst Lenske's question, where, why should we consider this kind of effective value of GA? This comes mostly about from, from lack in nuclear structure calculations. And what are these, these, these uh, drawbacks in, in many of the nuclear structure calculations? Uh, I, I have grouped them in, in, in three different uh, bins here. So these are non-nucleonic degrees of freedom, which are not always taken into account, or most, most time not taken into account. Then uh, something which goes beyond this approximation of just one nucleon decaying. So there can be other nuclei with nucleons which are active actually at the same time. So then we go beyond the so-called impulse approximation, for example, to these two-body currents, which are of interest lately very much, actually. And then these deficiencies in nuclear many-body approaches, uh, missing configurations, missing three-body interactions, and, and uh, things like that. So uh, let's go now to the double beta decay nuclear matrix elements, which was the main topic of my talk, uh, and see what, what, what is going on there. Uh, Kai already introduced in a nice way uh, what is happening there, actually, is this is two neutrino double beta decay, uh, 116 cadmium. And as, as Guy mentioned, there is this axial coupling, which is to the fourth power. And it means that it plays a Q 
key role actually, especially for experimentalists. It is a pain in the neck actually for experimentalists because it can be that, I mean, your sensitivities there very much depend now on the value of this coupling here, unfortunately. Uh, then the neutrinoless case is this one here with, with the exchange of this massive Majorana neutrino uh, with, with uh, induced lepton number violation here. And again, you have in the game, you have this effective coupling here. But as you can see, it is not the same coupling as, as here be before because this coupling now refers to processes which are having momentum exchanges in the range of 1 MeV. Whereas this process here is actually involving uh, intermediate energies which are of the order of 100 MeV. So you see that there are different scales in energy scales and momentum scales uh, in these processes. So that's why this I, I denote in a different way this, this symbol which this is uh, axial coupling, which is now carrying this, this uh, memory of this neutrinoless 100 MeV energy scale. So, I mean, this is now how it looks like in theory. Uh, the neutrinoless double beta decay nuclear matrix element, it has this front factor here, as, as already indicated. And then, in addition, you have all those Fermi matrix element, which contributes in a non-negligible non way, actually. And as we, when, I, when we kind of review now, Kai, Kai already, I mean, somehow reviewed the status of this nuclear matrix element, but this is a very illustrative, uh, illustrative uh, comparison of these two, I mean, of different aspects here. So these are now very recent calculations, uh, state-of-the-art calculations of the things here. And you, as you can see, there's, there, there is the problem here. So, I mean, in terms of half-lives, which is for this effective neutrino mass of 50 milli electron volt, so you have a large spread of the predicted uh, half-lives by the state-of-the-art, different state-of-the-art theories. So this is, this is a problem. And, and if you add the, the GA problem here, in addition, you, you get an additional uh, uncertainty of one uh, order of magnitude, so you have in altogether two orders of magnitude uh, kind of uh, playground where you can really play around and, and try to fit your, your sensitivities of, of, of um, experiments. So I have to say that in that respect I'm not very uh, kind of uh, envious uh, to these, these experimentalists who try to figure out, I mean, how the hell, what, what, amount of, what amount of substance should I buy from the shop, you see, I mean, one ton or ten tons and so on, in order to be able to measure this process. Okay, but this gives you an idea about the difficulties in, in respect to the nuclear matrix element calculations, also this GA problem. So, I mean, so that, that, is, that is a pain in the neck or even lower uh, if, 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 if we don't so, sort out this, this problem. So now, how to, how to determine, uh, how, to, how to somehow study the values of these, these uh, effective couplings here. And this is the, the traditional way of doing that. So uh, you want to study uh, this, this neutrinoless double beta decay couplings by going to the zero momentum exchange region like this, and then you involve these beta decays, simple allowed beta decays, and two neutrino double beta decay transitions in the one plus channel here, which is typically denoted by this simple uh, symbol GA. And I don't want to go into details of, of the nuclear structure models. It doesn't make many, much sense in this audience, actually for this audience. But we have three different types of, of well-established nuclear structure frameworks which were, using to, were used to study this, this GA problem. And uh, what are uh, the targets? The targets are this kind of simple gamma of teletransitions like this kind of cascade here. So you have information about the decay rates, this information you can use, or you have this kind of lateral feeling 
feeding type of, of, of a situation. And then you have three cases, only three cases, where you both know the, the, the feeding of the beta decays and the rate of double beta decay, two neutrino double beta decay. There are only these three cases, but you can use it very effectively, actually, because these are very, very constrained conditions for the nuclear structure calculation to be able to simultaneously predict the double beta decay and single beta decay branches. So this is a non-trivial problem and, and has been attacked many times. And this is, uh, I don't want to go into details, this is a kind of summary of these studies, which, uh, which is a huge number, actually. Uh, they are rather consistent for the first, because this is a bit surprising, because all these three nuclear uh, approaches are very different in, in character, in, in basic philosophy, and so on. But we have this kind of a uh, pattern which seems to be, be nuclear uh, uh, mass dependent structure here. Latest results are coming from up initial calculations. They are not somehow on the same playground as these calculations because these up initial calculations here include the two body currents uh, in a consistent way, whereas these calculations do not include these two body currents. So this is a difference, which is a which is, uh, very remarkable difference, actually, between this ab initio and these other approaches. But, I mean, we have to sort out, I mean, how to include also, also these, these uh, tuber currents to the uh, calculations which are able to attack these, these higher nuclear masses. So this is the situation uh, at the moment. And then, how about all the other intermediate states of the neutrinos double beta decay. They are not only these, these uh, one plus states, but they are a host of, of different multiples through which you actually go. As in this case of 116 cadmium decay, there are these high, higher multiples through which you go. And, and how to study these effective couplings, this is also uh, a, bit, a bit a problem. So one possibility, again, uh, we are, we are uh, involved in this kind of process where I mean, you have to go to the low momentum exchange limit and then you ha can <coughs> somehow involve this kind of spectrum shape method which was mentioned by Kai already, which was used by the COBRA experiments, for example. And there you can try to access the electron spectra of forbidden non-unique beta decays. So what are these forbidden non-unique beta decays? Uh, they are here. This is a rather complicated thing. I mean, this is a half-life uh, beta decay, half-life of a nucleus. It contains this kind of constant here, but then this kind of shape function where you have a shape factor here. This is one for the allowed decays, so just pure one. So it is very simple. I mean, for allowed decays, this, this shape factor is, is very simple, whereas for the, uh, this uh, higher forbidden non-unique decay, beta decays, it is a mess. It is a huge mess uh, which, which, which takes several pages of uh, 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 text to, to be written down. But what one can do is to boil it down to this kind of very simple expression, which is actually having three parts, which is a vector part here, axial vector part, and then the mixed part. And now there's an interplay. Uh, there could be some interplay between this mixed part and, and the, these other two parts here. And this is now where this actually appears, this, this GA uh, somehow sensitivity of this kind of spectra, electron spectra, uh, in the first place. So, I mean, this is one, ex oh, two examples actually, uh, which are shown here. Uh, this is now uh, 94 niobium decay, and you can see this dependence uh, of the value of the axial coupling. This is for vector coupling equals one, and the same here. This is 98 technetium decay, and again you have this strong sensitivity of, of, uh, for, to, to, to the value of effective coupling. So there are other decays which are very interesting actually and in this place are again I mean urge experimentalists for measurements of these 
These are nice cases you see, very relevant uh, for, for the axial coupling, but for some other things also maybe, not only, only, only this, uh, for this, this purpose, but these are, uh, I, I very much urge people to measure these things. These are, I mean, the, we have calculated those using different nuclear models also. There are already measurements being, being uh, going on actually, so Kai was mentioning already this one, uh, 113 cadmium case. Then there is a measurement of 115 indium in another other work here. And then there's a, uh, this kind of, this, this is, I mean, this is interesting measurement actually by the XO200 uh, collaboration of, the, of, the, of, a, of a spectral shape. It is not depending on GA, but it is very relevant for the reactor anti-neutrino anomaly. Uh, and and I, I don't know if, if Giorgio is going to mention anything about, okay, he doesn't mention anything about this, but I mean, but still, I mean, this is very highly interesting for the reactor neutrinos. So, I mean, then another aspect which is uh, producing very, very long half-lives is the, 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 low, uh, the low Q value decays. And in this case, I mean, we have the famous uh, cutting experiments which had lots of exposure recently, so in press and everywhere. So it has uh, this tritium, tritium decay where you have approximately the 20 kV of Q value, which is a low Q value. Because the, then you can clean the end point of the spectrum. The end point of the spectrum is the one which is very interesting. There you have the distortion of the spectrum uh, in terms of the, of the neutron ma neutrino mass. And then you can go one order of magnitude, roughly one order of magnitude lower. And this is the rhenium experiment, which is, I mean, not realized yet, but I mean, I mean, was considered already. In principle, so that, uh, the, the, the figure is this. So, I mean, you have the, these two tritium and rhenium. I mean, these are in scale, actually, these, these uh, this uh, spectra here, and you look for, for distortion, distortions uh, in terms of nuclear uh, neutrino mass at the end point. And then, I mean, you, try one, you can try to search uh, for other good candidates, and this is one proposal, actually proposed candidate here, 135 cesium decay, where there were Q value measurements which were in, in uh, strong uh, tension between each other. We were proposing that long time ago already, but nobody measured it, but it was, there, now there was a recent measurement actually uh, in, in Yifel Trap and Tommy Eronen will talk about this on Tuesday. And, and, and so I, uh, this is an appetizer for this very interesting measurement. Uh, please have a look at that on Tuesday. Then. I have something about competition between beta and double, two neutron double beta decays, which is also quite interesting. We have made a recent calculation of these two cases here, uh, four, 48 calcium double beta decays and beta decays, as also 96 zirconium. These were Shelmore calculations. Actually, this was the first time when Shelmore calculation was applied to this nuclear, nuclear decays here. And as you can see, there might be possibility for uh, measurements of this, this beta decays with the phi plus state, which is now for forbidden unique decay with simple line shape. So, I mean, this is now, I urge again, experimentalists to tackle this problem because in principle, you could maybe in the near future make measurements of this kind. So then another aspect uh, which is very much related to neutrinos double beta decay is so-called ordinary muon capture, because now we have uh, accumulating uh, nice new results for uh, partial muon capture rates and also this kind of uh, strength, strength distributions of, of muon capture. And what is muon capture? Muon capture is a kind of uh, complementary process where you can uh, take a look at the contents or guts uh, uh, neutrinos double beta decay. This, this is a high end momentum exchange process, you see, because of the high uh, mu, muon mass, high muon mass of, of, of the order of 100 MeV. It means we are in the ballpark of, of 100 MeV in the same ballpark as, as 
neutrinos double beta decay. So we can actually study uh, by this process, you see, the, the value of this axial coupling which relates to neutrinos double beta decay directly. And also, in, as a byproduct, we can also study induced uh, currents also, which are also involved in, in neutrinos double beta decay, like induced pseudo-scalar coupling. And, um, uh, and this, as I said, I mean, this is kind of, uh, kind of electron capture, simple electron capture process, but, but this electron is very heavy. And then, I mean, involving all these, these higher, uh, higher order terms in the, in the, in the, the, um, the uh, capture rate. But there are nice new uh, measurements being pursued actually in RCNP Osaka, in J Park, and also PSI uh, in, in Switzerland. And the latest one very nice measurement was done actually by, by RCNP and, and together with J Park. And this is the first time they measured this kind of muon capture uh, giant resonance. This is the first time measured giant resonance state in, in muon capture. And we, there was also uh, theory computation of this resonance and the match is, is almost perfect. So, so as you can see, so this is, this is published in this, guy, this, this physics letters paper. And then we, there are more calculations and comparisons with nuclear matrix element. This will be, uh, will be discussed by Lotta Jokiniemi on Friday. So, I mean, wait for this nice talk about this, this good, nice chances of this, this uh, capture mode. And now, finally, about reactor neutrino anomaly, which is also a very burning issue at the moment, because the, that, together with gallium anomaly, they, imp they have implications for sterile neutrinos. And sterile neutrinos at the moment are very sexy. Everybody wants to have sterile neutrinos, of course. And these, these are related to sterile neutrinos in, in, in certain ways. This sterile is in the range of few uh, EV. Uh, this gallium anomaly here is discussed uh, on Friday by Joel Kostensalo. So again, I urge you to, to, to listen to that nice talk. Instead, here I, I give some background of, of, of this anti-neutrino anomaly. I mean, this uh, comes from the fission products of these, uh, these, these nuclei here, which are used as fission fuels uh, in, in nuclear reactors. In, in these big experiments, Diabay, Reno, Double Shoes, they, these are two detector experiments where you have a far detector somehow measuring the neutrino oscillations. And then the, the neutrino flux is, is measured by a near detector. And what happened in the near detector, which is somehow measures this flux here, is the following. Um, it measures a flux which is 5% smaller than, than predicted by, by, by careful access to the, the, the fission yields and so on uh, by, by nuclear databases and so on. And this, of course, can be interpreted as oscillations to sterile neutrinos because you miss some part of this, this, this uh, flux there. But there's a uh, big problem here, which is a bump in the measured spectrum a spectrum shape by these this experiments at uh, 4 to 6 MeV. And this is called this kind of spectral bump or, or spectral shoulder. And what is the reason? I mean, wh wh where does it come from? I mean, I don't tell you. But instead, I, I urge you to, to listen to, to, to Landon, Hi Landon Hyatt's talk. He will tell wh what is it all about, this bump and so on. This is a very recent finding, excellent, very interesting. So this is, uh, to summarize, I was discussing several aspects. I mean, I was uh, pointing uh, to the fact that, I mean, this effective GR, GA is operative everywhere. Then uh, this is the kind of summary of the present status of these GA studies. So they are consistent in a way uh, and, and uh, hinting to uh, nuclear mass dependent quenching. Then we have the spectral shape method, which is where you can study this uh, problem of GA again for higher forbidden decays. Then these forbidden decays are essential part of this reactor anti-neutrino spectra and the associate anomaly. 
Uh, then uh, neutrino mass uh, measurements will be explored by, by this, this spinning trap experiments. And finally, uh, ordinary muon capture, which is separate from the radiative one, is, is, uh, is, is a very nice method to study high momentum exchange region like, like the neutrino double, neutrino double beta decay, but also some other processes. And the outlook is, is uh, I urge you again for, to measure things. So I plead you, even, even I, can, I, can, uh, I can, I don't know, I mean, I mean, kneel down, you see, and beg that you measure all these things here, which I propose. OK, I think this was enough. Uh, I hope you didn't have fell, fall asleep, I mean, for two long periods. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>